Hey, good morning. I hope you are ready to get into God's word today. We are, like Pastor Jeremiah said, we're concluding our series, series Hold It Together. And we've really been addressing mental health and how that lo- what that looks like in a believer's life and going to God's word and his promises and, and really facing real issues and letting God minister to us. Because we're in this life, Jesus promised we would have trouble. He said, in this life you will have trouble. We're in a fallen state. We're not in the perfect state. One, one day we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. And everything's going to be restored. But so much is broken because of sin in the earth. There's so much pain. And so our series is Hold It Together. And our main scripture that we've been standing on is Colossians 1.17. Because we don't have to hold it together. We don't have to keep it together. And sometimes we do more damage to our souls when we try really hard to muster up some kind of strength. When in reality, we need to look to the one who holds everything together. It says he and he, Jesus, is before all things and in him all things hold together. And this is, there's so much to this verse and it's so important that we hold on to that idea, that truth that says before all things because that's part of the promise. He, Jesus existed before us. So when the temptation is to take the weight onto ourselves and bear the burden and bear the responsibility of all the healing that has to get taken care of, we can remember Jesus was way, way, way here before us. He didn't get created. He existed. And he now wants to help us. And he's going to hold it together for us. We're going to be in 1 Kings 19, and we're going to start kind of in the middle of the story, and then we're going to backtrack a little bit. But just to get you up to speed, I really encourage you to go read this story, because we're talking about Elijah. And we're going to talk about, we're really going to be addressing fear today. We've talked about anxiety, we've talked about stress, and all of those things are a part of our lives. It's unavoidable. But we have a relationship with the one who can help us when those things touch and hit our lives. And so today we're going to be talking about fear. And Elijah is this powerful man of God who has been allowing God to do miracles in and through him. He stood up. He had the courage to stand up to 450 false prophets. And there was this big standoff of whose God is real. And of course, they're calling on this fake God, Baal, and nothing happens. And so now he's like kind of taunting them because he knows the one true God. And God allows him to stack the odds and a miracle happens. Well, God shows up, reveals who he is, but then the leaders want to take his life because he took care. He took out the false prophets, and this made the leaders so, so angry. And so he ran. They wanted to take his life. So that's where we're going to pick up right now in 1 Kings 19. It says, and there he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, I am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So don't you love how God will just let you vent? I love that I serve a God who is so secure in who he is. That when I'm going through something and I'm feeling some kind of way, he gives me space to be real with him. And Elijah's having a moment because he's like, God, I've been faithful. I've been doing the work, Lord. I've been doing all the things for your behalf. Nobody believes. And I've been doing everything I can to obey you. And now they want to take my life too. And he's just getting real. And he said, this is God, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said the same thing. What are you doing here, Elijah? I've entitled today's message, The Sound of God's Presence. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you've created sound. And there's so much power in sound. And Lord, I just pray that today we would recognize more clearly 
the sound of your presence in our lives. Would you give us ears to hear? That's what you commanded us, Jesus. Give us ears to hear. God, so if there's any buildup that causes us not to hear your voice, not to recognize when you're right here with us, that you would show us, Lord, show us the areas that maybe we have not trusted you, but instead trusted in our own strength and trusted in our own abilities. Forgive us when we take on things that we were never meant to carry. Do your work today, Holy Spirit, and heal our hearts. Let our minds be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And we thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, amen. So we're going to be talking about the sound of God's presence because it's a very real thing. And I believe God wants us to be familiar with the sound of his presence. Uh, I was thinking about the power of sound, and there's some sounds that, you know, when you, there's certain things that can trigger you, like if you hear a song, it makes you think of maybe a person or an event, or maybe a loud noise and it startles you. Uh, well, there's familiar sounds in my life that are really endearing to, me, endearing to me, and one of those sounds is my garage opening and closing. And I know that's a very simple thing, but what that says when I hear that garage opening and closing, it says one of my loved ones in my household is either coming home or leaving my home. Their presence is either going to be here with me or their presence is leaving. And God wants us to be familiar with the sound of his presence. So if you're, if you're a new believer or maybe you have been walking with the Lord, but you're still trying to figure out when God is speaking and how he is speaking, the first order of business is to know this word. Because when we know this word, we'll know his voice. And it, it's also important to know that we have an enemy who s says lies. He speaks lies to us because he's the enemy of our souls. And we need to be just as familiar with God's voice as the lies of the enemy. Because we live in a world that is so fallen, so confused, and the enemy is doing that on purpose. He's spewing lies. While God speaks truth, the enemy is spewing lies. And we as the church, we have to know his voice. Because there's coming seasons, just like Elijah. Every one of us is going to have an Elijah moment where we're maybe doing all these things for the Lord. And because we love him. But there's going to be times where threats are going to come our way. And we can run and hide because that is our tendency. That is a fleshly temptation to run and hide. You're going to see that happening m multiple times in, in different people's lives. And can we just admit that we also run we like to run we want to run from our pain we want to run from our issues we want to run from ourselves we want to run from people and God's word is going to help us today so we're going to rewind the, the scripture and go at the beginning of the passage in first kings 19 1 through 8 and it says Ahab told Jezebel that's the leader Ahab told his wife Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets these are the false prophets with the sword then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. So she's threatening his life. It says, then he was afraid. This is so important for us to understand. It doesn't matter where we are in our walk with God. There will be temptations to walk, run in fear. The enemy wants to take us out. And he'll even use people to spew lies at us, to threaten us. But that's why we've got to be strong in the word. So that we recognize this is an attack of the enemy. And he was dealing with fear. The man of God was dealing with fear. And it says, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba. Which belongs to Judah. And left his servant there. Listen, it'll make us run. Run from the call of God. Run from the people of God. So we've got to be careful of that when we have those tendencies to want to run. It says, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die. That's how in despair, he didn't want to live anymore. Saying, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life. For I am no better than my father's. Fear will make you say really contradictory things to the word of God. And to the truth of what's happening in our lives. This man of God who has been allowing God to do miracles in his life. Now he's like, I'm not even better than any of my dads. <laughs> he's just speaking. And it says, and he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. And, eat. and he looked and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. Listen, 
Sometimes you just need to take a nap. And sometimes you just need to eat some food. Hangry is a real thing. It's a real thing, you know. And some, have you, have you ever, do you ever space out sometimes when you get so hangry and then you just eat something and you're like, oh, life is not as bad as I, saw, I thought it was. I, I have better perspective on life right now because I ate that food, you know. But sometimes we just need to take a nap and eat some food because Elijah was done at this point and God knew Elijah was done. That's why you got to be so encouraged right now by the presence of the Lord. Because he's near. And he can deal it with us when, when we've just had enough. Because life will happen like that where you've just had enough. And you just want to quit. And you feel like you've been doing things for the Lord. And it's like you just want to quit. Listen, welcome to the club. My husband and I, we want to quit sometimes. We don't always feel like being up here. We don't always feel like writing sermons. We don't feel like carrying the burden week after week. But that's the difference between a calling and a career. I didn't ask for this. God assigned this to me. So I want to encourage you today because I know that the enemy is so sneaky and he wants to take you out of your assignment. And you need to let the Lord minister to you when you're done. Be careful not to read into narratives or look into things when you're done because the Lord himself wants to minister to you personally. It says, and he ate and he drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, arise and eat for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food. See, 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. This was God's way of saying, I'm not done with you yet, Elijah. And when the Lord's not done with us, then we, as long as we stay close to him and remember that he's near, and we do what we know we're supposed to be doing in our relationship with the Lord. Listen, God will tell you when you're done. It will be abundantly clear. But if he gives you breath in your lungs, then your assignment is not over. I've seen so many people get taken out by so many different things. They leave, they quit their calling, they quit their assignment because something happens, you know, some, something tragic or there's an offense or things like that. But that's why we got to let God guard our hearts. And listen, no ministry is too small. Like it, food, food was a ministry. Food was needed in this circumstance. Then we got some beautiful people in the church that know how to cook and I praise the Lord for you. Because the, the temptation is just be like, oh, well, it's just this. Well, it's just this dish. Well, it's just this. And it's like, take the just out of it. There are no just, just this in the kingdom of God. I praise God for every single gift. And your gift is no less than my gift. And your calling is no less than my calling. And I want you to know that you have value and worth in the kingdom and in the body of God. So be encouraged. Keep going. Keep going, keep listening. And I know that God will continue to speak to you and through you. So if you're taking notes, we're going to talk about the presence of God. And the first thing is, is God's presence sounds personal. He wants us to have this own personal relationship with him where we can hear him and recognize when he's speaking to us. In the garden after the fall, it says, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. There was this familiarity about how God's presence arrived and they, they recognized that because they had been walking with the Lord. But now they're being separated because of sin. And it says, and the man and his wife hid themselves. See, they, that's what we do. Our flesh and nature wants us to hide from God, hide from our very creator. Think about that. And it says, from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. You can hear God's presence. You can feel and sense God's presence, and he wants it to be real and personal. See, the revelation that God is near reveals the quality of my relationship with him. The revelation that God is near reveals the quality of my relationship with him. Let me give you a for instance. I can tell when God still needs to work to truth in my life by the way I respond and act to things that happen around me. Sometimes I get panicked, and I'm like, how am I going to do it? 
I was going to get it done. And I, I, I just like take on the overwhelm, you know? I don't know if you've ever been there. And it's just like, oh. And then the Holy Spirit so gently is like, this is an area you stop trusting me. And he wants to reveal that to us. Because the, the reality is, and when, when you're in the storm, okay, when you're in the storm, that's why you got to keep looking up to God. Keep staying anchored on him. Because everything else is going to pass away. But we can rely on him. I will fail you. Someone else will fail you. It's just going to happen because we're fallen and we are not God. <laughs> he is. And he keeps us grounded. And when I think about it, I'm like, yeah, Lord, that's right. Why did I get overwhelmed? Why did I get so stressed out about all those things? Because stress is going to happen. But I, I, when I look up to him, I'm reminded he's all powerful. He's all knowing. And that he's going to provide. He's going to provide. Insert whatever it is you're waiting on the Lord. He's going to provide. And I'm speaking to the choir, but one thing that I've learned in my relationship with the Lord is not to confuse provision with plans. God will provide, but he doesn't always give you the plans. He says, no, you're just going to have to trust my plans. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So when you start feeling like you're drowning and you don't know what in the world God is doing, I've got to trust in his ways. Because the truth is, there's, there's, you cannot find a crack in God's character. You cannot find any, he's holy, he's pure, he's perfect, he's sovereign. And when we don't understand why he allows things to happen the way they do, we try to get on the throne. Because we think we know something. And I, I was talking to a dear sister before first service and she was talking about how like sometimes it, at, at first glance you could appear at a bad situation as, as bad. But she said, all I saw was God was all in it. I said, those are worship eyes right there. Because that means I can go through whatever in my life, insert circumstance, insert pain, insert rejection, whatever it is. I can go through any of those things and I could just view that as a bad thing. Like, why, God, did you let this happen? And God can handle those whys, by the way. He's big enough. But I can also have the discipline to say, wow, God, you really were working. You really were moving. You really were trying to teach me something. And God was teaching Elijah something as well. And so we can learn to, to talk to God. God can hang, handle our anger. When we're angry about something, he can handle it. The, the key is, is not to live there, not to stay there. And that takes a lot of work to guard your heart against bitterness. It takes a lot of work to say, I'm not going to hold on to that. I'm not going to be angry about that. I can be angry about it, but then I let God say, you show me that there's something at work. He's doing something that I don't understand, and I just need to be a daughter in the hands of the king. And trust that he's God and that he's working on my behalf. I love this quote by Oswald Chambers. He says, the checks of the spirit come in the most extraordinarily gentle ways. And if you are not sensitive enough to detect his voice, you will quench it. And your personal spiritual life will be impaired. His check always comes as a still, small voice. So small that no one but the saint notices them. So that was, God, God was showing himself to Elijah. Asking the question, where are you, Elijah? And God allows us to answer him. And that's what Elijah was doing. So back in uh, 1 Kings 19, he says, again, he says, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel to be king over Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi. You shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Meholah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazel shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. And so even here, we're seeing the grace and mercy of our Lord for the people that may not be a spiritual leader. 
but yet they had a conviction not to bow down to a false god. And God's saying, I'm going to spare their life. And he's trying to show Elijah, Elijah that, hey, I've got your successor coming. You don't have to worry about doing this for the rest of your life. I've got you covered. Listen, when we don't understand, we got to wait on the Lord. When we don't get it, we wait on the Lord. And waiting is one of the hardest things to do. But he's teaching in us patience in those seasons, saying, God, your timing is so perfect in my life. I trust in your timing. When God allows us to go through long periods of suffering, there's a reason for it. He doesn't enjoy it, but it does teach us and train us in the ways of the Lord. And it allows us, he gives us what we can do when we're going through hard times. The next point about God's presence is God's presence stirs up a response to worship. It was so beautiful, so beautiful seeing people come to the altar because they just had to worship the Lord. They just had worship in their heart. And I love it. I love when I get to hear the saints and they're singing on their own and praising the Lord on their own because what I know is represented in those words and in that song and in that cry is a life probably full of pain. And yet they are giving him a sacrifice of praise. And just because someone's praising the Lord and just because someone's worshiping the Lord does not mean they're not carrying something really deep and heavy. That may be their only weapon in this season to carry them through. And we need to let the presence of God stir us up into worship. We got to ask ourselves, what is my response? When I'm going through something, is it worship? And if it's not, why is it not worship? What, is, what do I need to die to myself? I want to share a really cool illustration from my friend Esther. I didn't even know. She's in my small group. And she sh told me about this nerve. It's called the vagus nerve in our body. And it's activated through sound when we speak. And this, when, when we activate this vagus nerve, it actually settles our central nervous system. It calms us down. And they have... Um, earthly ways to, to do that by going like, you know, and like there's ways that it will calm us down and it helps with stress. But look at all the ways, all the different body parts it affects. This one nerve affects the heart and the lungs, the liver, the stomach, the spleen, and the GI tract. It's all affected. But the beautiful part that, I, that Esther shared with me that I just loved was she said when she was here during a worship time, she was singing to the Lord, and she could tell that her vagus nerve was activated by singing to the Lord. And I was like, that is so like God. Tim, when he says you're fearfully and wonderfully made, we, like, we don't even have a clue, guys. We don't even know the full extent. But it's so like God that when we deal with stress in life, he has given us a weapon, and that is called worship. And when I choose... To use that weapon, supernatural things happen in our life. Sometimes God does not want to give us the breakthrough. He wants us to have breakthrough. Sometimes God lets us stay there and stay there and stay there because there's something he's still got to work out of us. And so we can trust, but we need to have that response of worship because he created us. And when we worship Man, I'm telling you, we don't worship to get benefits, but we get a lot of benefits when we worship. And then I'm reminded of the goodness of God and the power of God and, and all of these qualities about God. And my problem just got a lot smaller. And my God got a lot bigger in my, in my presence. So the next thing is, is that God's presence strengthens our courage because courage is a muscle. I know that there's some people that may have more courage than others. But it is something that all of us can grow in. And courage is so that we can combat fear when fear wants to take our lives and makes us want to run from God, run from the call of God, run from the people of God. God will give us courage. Because here's the thing. Fear is not a unique battle, but it does show up uniquely to each individual. So every single person deals with fear. Some people just carry it better, and that's okay. But everybody deals with fear, and it's, it's, it's a, a tactic of the enemy, a strategy of the enemy, and that's why it's so important how he uniquely shapes it to your life. 
in my life. Because it's amazing how some people will be fearful of this, but I, that, that doesn't even bother me. And I'll be fearful of something, and it wouldn't phase another brother or sister. But that's why we need to allow God to show us how the enemy tries to work in our lives. Because he's tricky. I, I was watching a TikTok, and it was talking about fear. And there was this dad, I don't think he was a, I don't think he was a believer, but he was saying that he never lets his kids out of his sight. Like, he never lets his kids go play unless he is there with them. And, you know, I don't know ages, so I'm not judging the circumstance. But I did think about, wow, that's a heavy burden to bear. The protection of your children. And I realized that I, I've been praying for safety over my kids since they were little. And I realized, like, because every time, it takes faith to let my kids leave the house without me. I'm just going to be real. Every single time they leave that door and I'm not with them, it takes faith to say, God, they're in your hands. They are your kids. Now, that does not mean we should be foolish stewards of our children and we should provide protection. That is a given. But there gets a point in time where you have to release your kids and trust that they're in God's hands. Even when they're making foolish decisions, oh, oh, that'll get you. Oh, I could save, I could save you 10 years if you'd listen to me. And the older they get, the more you have to give freedom, unless they abuse it. We have those talks as well. But every single time I tell my kids, I'm like, when, before they walk out of the house, I, I shout out to them, keep your head on a swivel. And I, I just... Trust, God, give angels charge over my kids. God, you, you assign who needs to be around them. You protect them from evil. Because this uh, here's the thing, you've got to talk to your kids about this. The world is, has evil in it, with evil people, with evil intentions, that they, they are malicious in their intent. But that's why we have to talk to our kids first and say there are dark things out in the world. But we don't shrink back because there's darkness in the world. We have the light of the Lord, and we have the protection of the Lord. It doesn't mean that God won't let things, bad things touch their lives at times, and they'll learn from it just like we've all learned from it, right? But see, that's, do you see how little of a tweak that is when fear enters in our lives? Because I could be, I could be like, no, you can't go anywhere. No, you can't do that thing. No, you can't, you can't spend time here. You can't, I could, but I would be in bondage. And then they would have to go to counseling for the trauma I caused them. <laughs> so we, we as parents, we just need to remember that the enemy will show up in fear in different ways uniquely to each of us. And that's why we've got to have our own personal relationship with the Lord and recognize the sound of God's presence. In Genesis 3, we read this verse earlier. It says, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man and said to him, where are you? Asking that question again. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid. So Adam already, he was very familiar with the sound of when God shows up. And now instead of fearing the Lord, not in, not in a reverential fear, but in a, in a scared fear because sin has now entered into the world. They're immediately experiencing the consequences of sin. It says, because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? By the way, God always knows the answers to his own questions. We just don't. We don't know the answers. We can be stubborn. We can be closed off to what is actually happening. We can misinterpret what's happening. And in verse 12, it says, the man said, the woman whom you gave to me to be with me. Whew. The blame game didn't take long. At first, she was like, this woman, you know. Now it's like, hey, you gave this woman to me, Lord. <laughs> she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, because we have to be held accountable too, what is this that you have done? Given her a chance. But she takes, she follows the leader. 
And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So if you're not able to discern what's happening here, this is the fallen state now and they're playing the victim card. Instead of taking personal responsibility for their sin, who's the first person I can point to to say it's their fault? That's what sin will do. It's so deceptive that it will make us blame others. And here's the thing that I talk to my kids about. I always tell them, you are not a victim. And if you try to be a victim in life, your life is going to be miserable. Because you're always going to be blaming, well, and, and you're always subject to your circumstances. You're always subject to your emotions. When we have been called to be confident in the Lord and walk in his ways. But we can't play the victim card because we've got to take responsibility for what we bring. It, life, it, life is more about what we do with it and not what happens to us. Not to downplay because bad things happen to good people. And we're going we're gonna to even do a series on that because I know that's a question a lot of people have. But that is one of the consequences of sin. And we've got to learn how to grow in our courage so that when fear wants to set in and we want to run away and hide, that we have the courage in the moment and the boldness to do what God has called us to do. In Deut Deuteronomy 3, and we're going to close in just a minute, 31, it says, Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. God knows what we need to hear. And he commands us to be strong and courageous. And he commands us not to fear. And he commands us not to get discouraged. Did you know that? That's a commandment. Do not fear and do not get discouraged. Why? Because they're about to face a great enemy. And God's saying, all you need to know is I am with you. That's the sound of God's presence. We have to remind our flesh sometimes, no, God is with me. He's never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. Do I have moments of loneliness? Absolutely. But he is always faithful to be by my side, to be near. And then lastly, God's presence strengthens our courage. But lastly, God's presence allows us to speak with all authority. Remember that when you're speaking the word of the Lord, it's not in your own strength. It's not your own authority. We have received it because of the blood of Jesus. And it's a free gift that we receive and, and God will help us. And in fact, when Jesus was leaving, he was like, I'm going to send them a helper so that they can be bold to fulfill the calling, the great commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples. But he knew we needed boldness. In Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, it says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, this place of unity. They're all seeking the same. It says, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. See, God wants to get a hold of our tongue. When they experienced the baptism in the Holy Spirit, that was the first thing he was touching. That's the first thing he was giving courage for, was to speak in other tongues. And listen, if you've been a believer, but you don't know what the baptism in the Holy Spirit, so when we get saved and we receive Jesus, we are given the Holy Spirit as a seal, as a promise that we are a child of God. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is for a purpose. It is so that we can be witnesses in the earth. And it allows us to have this courage to do that. Listen, do you think it's just you when you want to share your faith or you want to go pray for somebody in the grocery store and you all of a sudden say, who do you think you are? Because we have a real enemy and he wants us to feel like we're imposters and that we're incapable and all of that has to do with what Bianca can do, not what God can do. So it's so important that we wait on the Lord and that we can trust that he moves on you and the Holy Spirit's like, here, do this. We can trust that he's going to give us the words. He's going to give us the wisdom. He's going to give us everything that we need. Why? Because God cares more about souls than we do. God cares more about lives than we do. And he's going to help us 
And so we're, we're even going to pray in just a moment. And if you've never received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, we're going to have some beautiful prayer partners down here. And you can just ask and receive and ask the Lord to touch your life if you've never been able to uh, experience that. But before we do, I want us to pray and take a moment to do the most important thing. And that is to give people an opportunity if you do not have a relationship with Jesus. So I want us to bow all of our hearts and our heads before the Lord. If that's you in this place and you're saying, Bianca, you've been talking about the word, you've been talking about running and hiding, but I have been running from the Lord and I want to make a commitment. Jesus came to this earth, died, lived a sinless life, died a criminal's death so that we didn't have to. Otherwise, we would have to die in our sins and spend eternity separated from a holy God. But Jesus willingly laid down his life. His blood pays for our sin, but we must receive it by faith. So if you're in this place, I want to ask you to do something courageous and bold, just so I know who I'm praying for. If that's you and you're saying, Bianca, I want to get right with the Lord. I want to give my life to him. I want to enter into a relationship with Jesus. You can just slip up your hand and slip it back down so that then I can know who I'm praying for. But I'm just going to leave you a minute. Thank you for that hand. Is there anybody else that's saying, Bianca, I want to give my life to the Lord? Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. Thank you. Amen. Anybody else saying, I'm making this commitment? Yes, I see those I see those hands. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all these hands. Maybe you're watching online. Thank you so much for what you're doing. This is what I want us to do. Church, can we encourage those that are making this commitment? And let's just pray with them. And you can do this by faith. Say, dear Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Wash and make me new. I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died for me. And you rose again. Help me live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church. Let's just celebrate the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. The Bible says that heaven rejoices even when one sinner repents. Praise the Lord. So there is a party in heaven.